Okay, um, hello again. Um, yesterday, I tried to give a, a, a lecture that focused on some of the sources and the methods that we can use uh, when studying landscape. Today, what I'm going to do is, is focus on some of the issues associated with how landscape developed in what traditionally has been regarded as a crucial point in the history of landscape and society across much of Europe, which is when the Roman Empire collapsed. The, uh, the period in uh, this part of the world is often called the Late Antique Period. This is a, a, a term that has never really been very uh, widespread in Britain. And I think that is largely because the traditional view is that Roman Britain stopped very suddenly rather than there being a longer, drawn-out process um, of decline. What I'm going to do is give you a few slides that just talk about this traditional view of, of what happened um, in Britain. Sorry, Alex, is it possible to have the text up there? Yeah, it's right. That is, is oh, okay. Okay, yeah. No, no, it's just it's easier if I can see the text up there. Yeah, that's why. Right. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so yeah, one of the other uh, issues I would say uh, problems with the uh, research into this period in Britain is that the focus has been on individual archaeological sites, individual settlements, uh, cemeteries, and so on. What I hope to show you today is a very different approach, and an approach that looks at landscapes as a whole rather than individual uh, sites. It is a case study of Britain, somewhere a long, long way away from here, an island right on the edge of the Roman Empire. But I hope the methodology, the approach, and this landscape-based focus should be of interest to uh, landscape archaeologists who are interested in the origins of the medieval landscape uh, anywhere across uh, Europe. Once again, as I stressed yesterday, if I use any terms that you're not familiar with, if I'm speaking too quickly and so on, please just stick your hand up and I can explain that particular term or concept uh, in more detail. So, as I said, the traditional view of the end of Roman Britain is that it collapsed very, very quickly in the very early, the first decade of the 5th century uh, AD. And the landscape of Britain is, is littered with abandoned Roman sites uh, such as this. This is a Roman uh, naval fortress on the east coast uh, of England. <coughs> Several years ago, uh, I embarked on a major project that sought to explore what was going on in the landscape of Britain uh, at this time, not from the perspective of the social elite, the army, uh, the administrators, the wealthy landowners living in villas and so on. I sought to explore this period from the perspective of the ordinary uh, rural farming communities. I wanted to know what was happening across the countryside as a whole, as opposed to on elite, on high status uh, sites. The project had three uh, themes. The first of these themes was to study uh, what we call environmental evidence 
So preserved plant and animal remains that tell us about uh, farming regimes, agricultural regimes. How did they change or not change when Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire? The second theme was to explore what was happening to uh, the field systems, the campi. Um, I learnt my first Italian word yesterday. Um, what happened to the field systems uh, across Roman Britain? And the third strand was exploring what happened to settlements. That third strand was carried out by a PhD student, um, and I don't think it's fair for me to be talking about her research, so I will focus in on the first two themes, land use and field systems. The images here illustrate some of the traditional approaches to this period uh, in uh, Britain. What we have uh, here is um, an aerial photograph which uh, shows a, a abandoned Romano-British farmstead showing up as a crop mark. Is that a term that's going to be familiar? Okay. So here you can see a crop mark of this enclosure and it's on a different orientation to these crop marks that go up and down the field that are the remains of medieval cultivation. This suggests a profound discontinuity within the landscape. A settlement was abandoned and it was replaced by a medieval system of cultivation. Traditionally, the date of that abandonment would be placed in the early 5th century when uh, Roman Britain uh, collapsed. There are other sites that have been uh, excavated that show slightly different stories. This is a, a Roman uh, villa in central England, to the south of which there is a small uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, settlement. The term Anglo-Saxon is a term that is used in British archaeology to refer to the migrants from Britain that came from what is now called Saxony in the north of modern Germany and Angeln, which is the southern part of Jutland Peninsula, uh, modern Denmark. So we combine the two uh, and use the phrase Anglo-Saxon to refer to these migrants from continental Europe that settled extensively across uh, eastern Britain. So what we have here is a Roman settlement that was abandoned and to the south you have one of these Anglo-Saxon uh, settlements. It appears that the, uh, the Roman villa here was actually abandoned, however, before this settlement was established. So once again, the story seems to be one of discontinuity. And in terms of the traditional picture in Britain, the, uh, the site here is a Roman villa in the west of Britain. And this is one of a number of sites that was excavated during the 1970s and the 1980s that did seem to suggest that the occupation of some Roman sites continued into the 5th century and perhaps even the 6th century. But such sites are very rare, and they are mostly found in the far west of Britain, not the area that saw the Anglo-Saxon immigration. 
In all three cases, however, what archaeologists in the past have focused on is the fate of individual settlements. Individual settlements, archaeological sites. What I wanted to do was to try to move the research agenda on from individual sites to explore what was going on within the landscape as a whole. The work that I did was made possible by a huge increase in the amount of field work, archaeological field work, that is now done in advance of development, like the construction of new roads, uh, the construction of pipelines, the quarrying, the extraction of sand and gravel for the construction industry, uh, and also uh, the development of new housing uh, and industry. On the screen here, these are just the covers of two examples of huge scale excavations that have been carried out, particularly in the east of Britain, in advance of this development. We have a principle in Britain that is now uh, quite widespread uh, uh, across uh, the European Union area, which is that where a developer is causing the destruction of archaeology, the developer, not the state, the developer has to pay the costs of archaeological survey and excavation. And this has led to an enormous increase in the amount of data, the amount of archaeological evidence that we now have. Some of it is published in impressive reports such as this. Other uh, sites are simply preserved through uh, archive reports, unpublished reports that are available online. So my work would not have been possible if it wasn't for all this field work that has been carried out by other archaeologists. One of the, uh, the crucial elements to the work that we did in this project was to recognize that there is profound regional variation across Britain and that that means that what happened at the end of Roman Britain could have varied in different parts of the country. Because Britain is an island, Roman Britain was a province, I think there has been a tendency in the past for archaeologists to assume that its character was relatively uniform. But as we have had this huge increase in the numbers of excavations that have taken place, we have started to realize that the character of the landscape across Roman Britain was very, very different in the east to the west, in the south to the north, and we're now even starting to recognize regional variations at, at relatively small scales the small scales of these districts that I talked about yesterday that we would call the Pei. Now, these maps here demonstrate the extent to which uh, regional variation in landscape character was recognized within Roman Britain up until relatively recently. So uh, these are the islands of Britain. The Romans never conquered uh, the north of Scotland or uh, the island of Ireland, but they did conquer essentially what is now the nation of England and the nation of, of Wales. Within this area, there is uh, a difference between the predominantly mountainous areas of Wales and northern England and then the area that is characterized here as the lowlands. And this distinction between upland and lowland 
was first written about by archaeologists in the 1930s. But as late as the 1990s, the agenda had really not moved on. And here we have uh, a book that was written in 1997, and it was still talking about this very simplistic division between essentially lowland Roman Britain and the upland areas to the west. So in 60 years, the understanding of the landscape of Roman Britain had not become any more sophisticated than it had been in the 1930s. Can I ask you a small question? Uh-huh. Do you think it was because a politics or British archaeologists don't have so much interest in understanding Roman period and much more later development? I think the, the problem was up until relatively recently, the archaeologists that studied Roman Britain were most interested in towns, forts, the Roman army, and Roman villas. And those are the most Romanized elements of society. They're the most archaeologically visible elements of society. They're also relatively uniform. Um, and I think they, Roman archaeologists were just not interested in the fact that within what is a very large area, the scale there is at 100 kilometers. They just weren't interested in the possibility that if you looked hard enough, you could see variation in, in identity on the part of communities within that lowland area. So it was the focus on the elite within society, coupled with the fact that before we have all of this developer-funded excavations, there wasn't as many excavations of, if you like, ordinary um, rural settlements. But I think the, the understanding the landscape was far more developed within prehistoric archaeology and medieval archaeology than it was in the Roman period. And I think part of what I hope I've achieved in this project is to bring some of the approaches that were very common within the study of the medieval landscape to studying the Roman landscape. That's what I hope. The, um, the one study that uh, started to recognize uh, some of the regional variation uh, in landscape character. It was by a chap called uh, Jeremy Taylor, and he produced this map that uh, show a series of uh, pie charts in which each of the uh, segments within the pie chart is reflecting different types of uh, rural uh, settlement. So he started to recognize that settlement in the western parts of England were of a somewhat different character to the east. But it was still um, a very crude piece of uh, analysis. What we did in uh, the project uh, on Britannia, the Roman province of Britannia, was we took a series of existing data sets. And this, for example, is the distribution of Roman uh, villas, so Roman country houses. And we use a series of data sets such as that to divide Britain into a series of different uh, regions. So, for example, the southeast region, uh, dominated economically by London, uh, East Anglia. This zone here you will recognize, hopefully, from yesterday. This is a region that was uh, very dominant and very different to the rest of England during the medieval period, and there is now evidence that its character was quite different to the rest of Britain in the Roman period um, as well. <coughs> 
This is the southwest region, which once again, if you remember, I talked about uh, yesterday as having a very distinct character in uh, the medieval period. Its character in the Roman period is also different, and it is absolutely fascinating because uh, communities living in this region here chose not to adopt many of the obvious uh, aspects of Romanization compared to the region here, which was very, very heavily Romanized. So, for example, in the whole of that region, there is just a single Roman town of any type. Uh, there is probably no more than about six Roman villas uh, all clustered around uh, Exeter. But even those villas lack uh, mosaic pavements, tessellated uh, pavements. So they're very low status uh, villas. If you go a few kilometers to the east in this region here, we have some absolutely fantastic uh, Roman villas that are comparable in their wealth and their status and their architecture to what you would find in mainland uh, Europe. So we have very, very clear regional differences in the character uh, of uh, Roman Britain. And uh, in the subsequent maps that I will be showing you, I say these are the regions that we divided uh, Roman Britain uh, into. Now, the first of our uh, research strands was using uh, paleo environmental material. Uh, the main source that we focused in on is pollen evidence. And is the class going to be familiar with the archaeological use of pollen? Yeah, okay. So uh, what we did, we ourselves didn't go out into the landscape and core peat bogs and then stare down microscopes for weeks on end identifying pollen grains. We did a synthesis of the uh, existing pollen data from across Roman Britain. And it was the first time that this synthesis had been carried out that included the results of all of the recent developer-funded uh, archaeological investigations in advance of road schemes, gravel quarrying, um, and so on. So the aim of this strand of our research was to try and explore what happened to land use and farming when Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire. Roman Britain, in common with the rest of the Roman Empire, had a money-based market economy. People were expected to pay taxes, so they had to produce a surplus of agricultural goods so they could sell that surplus at the market, raise some cash, and pay their taxes. So we would expect that as Britain ceased to be part of the Roman Empire, that money-based economy will have collapsed. And the traditional view is that this led to a profound change in land use with large areas of the landscape abandoned and farmland became woodland. That is the traditional view. And I must emphasize that because to preempt the evidence I'm going to present, I think that traditional view is uh, wrong. Now, what we did when we interpreted all of the pollen uh, evidence, we divided the plants that are represented by pollen in the archaeological record into four land use types. 
We divided the plants into uh, those that are indicative of arable cultivation. Now, this is actually quite rarely uh, cereals themselves, so wheat and rye and oats, because they produce relatively little pollen. So the arable indicative plants are often the weeds, the, the wild plants that grow on regularly <laughs> cultivated soil. Um, so, uh, one of our land use types was arable, uh, the others were uh, trees and woodland, so forest. Uh, we then had pasture, which is grassland for grazing sheep. And then finally, we had rough uh, grazing heathland, gorse, um, I don't know what the equivalent would be. Rough ground. <laughs> um, I mean, hopefully, when I showed you the uh, the aerial photographs of the English landscape yesterday, you realised how green everything is. Um, there is really good quality grass growing across the vast majority. Um, of our landscape. It is a much wetter landscape than the more arid regions uh, around the Mediterranean. So we looked at the pollen evidence and for a sample of uh, Roman Britain we also looked at uh, the animal bones and uh, the seeds from arable crops which we would call plant macro fossils. So seeds that you can see by eye as opposed to microscopic uh, pollen grains. The, uh, the two maps on the, uh, the, the left, uh, these were maps that were published in uh, the year 2000 showing sites within Britain that had pollen from the, uh, the Roman period and then the early medieval uh, period. So as recently as uh, 2000, there was very little pollen from this sort of eastern, essentially the lowland zone, um, of Britain. The map here uh, behind me uh, on the right, each one of these red dots is a site from which there is now pollen evidence. And hopefully as you compare the two sets of maps, you can see the impact 
of all of this developer-funded archaeological work. We now have a huge data set compared to just 16 uh, years ago. And we now have uh, pollen from all of these regions of Roman Britain, including the lowlands in the far uh, east. In terms of the results of the, uh, the pollen data, um, all of the actual raw data itself is percentages of different types of pollen grain from these different uh, sites. In terms of making that data intelligible, understandable to a wider audience, there is a variety of different ways of doing this. And what we've always tended to find is that some people, perhaps with a more scientific mind, like one particular form of presentation, those perhaps with a more uh, spatial mind, uh, a mind that works best looking at maps, prefer a different form of presentation. So I'm actually going to present this data in three different ways. Um, I personally think the last one is actually the easiest to understand. But the first couple of maps, I think, give a better sense of the raw data that is actually behind this analysis. So I will take you through uh, each one of them. <coughs> so, in this particular map, you can see the, uh, the regions of Roman uh, Britain. And for each region, we have a pie chart. Okay, The first pie chart relates to pollen from the Roman period. The second pie chart relates to pollen from the early medieval period. Each one of these uh, wedges, each one of these segments, is uh, the percentage of pollen from one of our four land use types. So in black, uh, here, we have uh, the arable. In white, we have the woodland, the forest. In the dark grey, we have rough pasture, and the light grey, is all of that beautiful green grassland that is so characteristic of the English uh, landscape. If we take uh, East Anglia, which is the region here, and for example, we look at this white segment, that's woodland and forest, we can see very little change from the Roman period through to the early medieval period. That completely contradicts the traditional view of what happened at the end of Roman Britain, was that as the market economy collapsed, agricultural land was abandoned, and woodland regenerated across the landscape. We know in... Uh, Regions like Britain, if you do not cultivate, if you do not graze agricultural land, it will become woodland, it will become forest within 30 years. Very, very quickly, you will get woodland regenerating in uh, the British uh, landscape. So I think what data like this shows is that across large parts of Roman Britain, similarly here in this central zone, no major change in land use from the Roman through to the early medieval period. Absolutely. And you, you, what you can then do, uh, you can... Oh, 
big drop there. Um, well, I won't go there. Um, you, just as you can compare change in uh, one region over time, you can also compare two different regions at the same point in time. So, for example, we can compare the southeast of England in the Roman period with, say, East Anglia and the central zone, and in particular, look at the white segment, which is woodland and forest. There was far more woodland and forest in the southeast in the Roman period than there was in places like East Anglia and the central zone. Now, the southeast is the hinterland of, of London, by far the largest and most important city uh, in England, in Britain, uh, from the, in the Roman and the medieval period. Perhaps 10% of the population lived in London. Yet its hinterland was one of the most extensively wooded and forested parts of Britain. And that was, I think, a, a, an unexpected uh, result uh, from the project. So overall, what I hope this analysis has shown is two things. Firstly, there was actually quite considerable regional variation in agriculture in both the Roman and the early medieval uh, periods. And secondly, nowhere was there a profound, a major change in land use as we move into the early uh, medieval period. This is suggesting a far greater degree of continuity than we would have previously thought, and therefore perhaps in Britain we should start thinking about referring to maybe the 5th century as the late antique period. And there are now quite a number of archaeologists and historians that are using evidence such as this to start referring to the 5th century in Britain as the late antique uh, period. So this way of presenting this data, I, I'm quite, I think this is, is quite easy to understand. The next way was created by uh, the chap who actually did the pollen analysis. He really likes it. I think it's rather complicated, but I'll show you it anyway. Um, oh, no, I don't need to press that, I need to press that one. Um, what we have here, uh, we would call these uh, histograms, and each little group of these uh, bars represents each region. So that's the southeast, that's the hinterland um, of London, this is East Anglia, this was that central zone. And in this analysis, you will see that, say, in the southeast, there are actually four vertical bars. That's because in this analysis, we have divided the medieval period into three subdivisions. These are more complex graphs but the complexity means that they can contain more information. So each one of these shaded bars represents a time period that is shown in the key down here. So the, far, the first bar is the Roman period, and then the, the black uh, bar is the 5th century so that's really the century that we're most interested in. The lightest shaded bar is then the 6th through to the 9th century. And then the final one is the mid-9th through to the 11th century. These dates were chosen. Essentially, this reflects when the, uh, the English landscape was uh, being disrupted by the Viking incursions and the end date is when uh, England was conquered uh, by the Normans. But it's really the comparison of the Roman 
and the 5th century that we are most interested in. And the change uh, in, uh, this is uh, woodland pollen, in that Roman to, uh, 5th century period is shown by this red arrow. So in the hinterland of London, in the southeast, for example, there was an increase in tree pollen. It went from around about 32 to around about 39%. If, however, we look at the central zone, that broad swathe through central England, we see that tree pollen actually declined. There seems to have been less woodland in the 5th century than there was in the Roman uh, period. You'll notice that this black bar is missing from the region that we call East Anglia. That's because, unfortunately, we've not been able to date any pollen evidence to the 5th century. Now, in terms of how we would interpret uh, the data uh, from uh, graphs such as this, I think it just uh, is important to stress that these percentages do not equate to the percentage of land use that was down to woodland, arable or pasture because uh, trees, for example, produce vast amounts of pollen. So although we've got sort of 30 to 40% of uh, the pollen comes from trees, that does not mean that 30 or 40% of the, uh, the area of the landscape was forested. Okay, it's just that trees produce huge amounts of pollen. So we're comparing the relative amounts in different periods in different regions. It's not giving us the absolute areas of uh, land use. The third way of representing this data, which personally I feel is, is probably the clearest, is um, a series of maps. This once again is reflecting the, the tree pollen, the woodland and the forest. And the darker the shading, the greater the amount of tree pollen there is in the archeological record. And as we can see, East Anglia, this central zone, this was the least wooded part of Roman Britain. The southeast, for example, was the most wooded of these lowland uh, regions. This is the situation in the early medieval period. And this map here, this map shows the change in tree pollen from the Roman through to the early medieval period. And what this shows uh, in the large parts of lowland Britain, there really wasn't a significant increase. Uh, this shading here is a 1 to 2 percent change. In the southeast, it was a change of perhaps 5 to 6 percent uh, on average. But even that need not represent an extensive abandonment of agricultural land. And this, for example, is a very traditional English way of producing a natural uh, field boundary. Uh, we've got a series of trees uh, that have been growing on a, a bank. One or two of the trees are left standing here. But most of them, the tree trunk has been cut halfway through and then the tree has been laid down horizontally. But because the trunk was only cut halfway through, the tree is still living. Okay? And so what you actually get is a natural living fence that forms uh, a natural barrier to livestock. When you do this with hedges, it stops the tree 
from growing to maturity and producing pollen. If you stopped managing the landscape in that way, eventually you would get mature trees growing up and they would produce pollen. So I would suggest that the small increases in tree pollen that we see in Britain at the end of the Roman period might not have been because of the abandonment of agricultural land. It might be because hedgerows were no longer being managed in this way. This is a very time-consuming, a very labour-intensive way of managing the countryside. And if you stopped doing that, eventually, as I say, trees would grow to maturity and produce pollen. And I would suggest that is what we are seeing in the pollen record, rather than the large-scale abandonment of agricultural land. So just to summarise this paleo-environmental uh, evidence, there has been a big increase in the amount of pollen work, and it's been transformative in our understanding of uh, the landscape. The big picture, the overall picture, is that there was only a very small increase in tree pollen in the early medieval uh, period. There is, however, variation from region to region in the extent to which land use uh, actually uh, changed. The largest increase was in the southeast of Britain. That central zone that I talked about yesterday, and I tried to explore with you sort of some of the reasons why that central zone in the medieval period saw the development of villages and these large open fields. Well, here we have another factor that might have lain behind that. It was this central zone in England that even back as far as the Roman period had been the most extensively cleared of woodland and was the most arable intensive uh, region. There is also a lot of variation at a local scale, which I don't think I will talk about now simply because you're not familiar with the, the, the English uh, landscape. So the big picture is huge increase in data. There wasn't a widespread abandonment of agricultural land at the end of Roman Britain. Very quickly, um, just to mention that we did also look at uh, the evidence from animal bones and uh, the seeds from agricultural uh, crops. This was extremely time-consuming because there was so much data. So we didn't have time to look at the whole of Britain. So we looked at what we would call a transect, a sample of the landscape that ran from the southwest peninsula through the Midlands into um, East Anglia. We produced... Uh, tabulated data such as this that looked at variations in the ratios of uh, sheep and goat, uh, cattle and pigs. And we looked at this both region by region and how things changed um, over time. And as I say, I won't go through this blow by blow. There's quite a lot of uh, statistics here. Um, but the, once again, the headlines behind this analysis is, once again, there is actually far more variation in the character of both Roman and medieval farming than we had previously suspected. Previous studies of agriculture in Roman and in early medieval uh, Britain had really talked in very general terms about how with Romanization we see an increase in cattle farming and so on. This work that we've been able to do that has benefited from all this developer-funded archaeology is actually showing 
that agriculture in the southeast of Britain was very different to that central zone uh, and so on. In terms of what happened uh, after the end of Roman Britain, however, once again we, we see some changes, but the changes are relatively minor. And I think these changes are also quite predictable. What we see over the course of the Roman period is an increasing emphasis on cattle. Cattle, uh, because beef was a favoured meat, certainly in the northern uh, Roman provinces. Similarly, with arable cultivation, with the growing of cereals, over the Roman period, we see a huge increase in the significance of wheat. Okay. What we see in the early medieval period is essentially a shift back to where agriculture was in the pre-Roman period, that is before the development of the money market-based economy. So we see a shift back to more mixed forms of farming. So rather than specialising in the production of beef and the production uh, of wheat, for the Roman market, and particularly the military and the urban consumers that loved beef and uh, wheat or bread made from wheat, we see communities going back to a form of farming that they had before the Roman market-based economy. It was a more subsistence-based form of agriculture. So we do see a change in the early medieval period, but we don't see the disappearance of agriculture. People carried on farming the land, but they did it in a more subsistence way rather than in a market-based form of agricultural uh, production. So Do pig. you see reduction of pigs? Pig. Pigs. Oh, right. <laughs> pigs. Um, so some name problem. Some people said there was a lot of pig production in Roman times for the military and so on, and they uh, diminished a lot in early medieval times. But now people start saying maybe not so much because they were easier to produce in yeah. Um, pigs are actually quite difficult to study with this form of sort of quite big picture analysis because in Britain pigs are usually quite a small proportion of the animals and so you've only got to get a relatively small change in the number of pig bones and as a percentage it can appear quite a lot. So the pig figures tend to be a bit like that. But overall, there's not really a major change over time. What you do get are variations between different sites of different social status. So pigs tend to be quite high on very highly Romanized sites, such as Roman villas. By, certainly by the, the 7th century and really emerging from the 6th century AD, so in the early medieval period, you get new forms of high-status sites, uh, particularly royal manors, and they also have relatively high proportions of pig. So I say they're sort of, they're there in relatively small numbers, and essentially you seem to get one form of high-status site and high-status consumption being replaced by another. Now, they are different, they're sites of different character, but the pig percentages are quite similar. So, say, quite a, a complex picture. Right, there you go.
That's exactly the same. That's interesting, actually, because that is exactly the same as we get in Britain. Um, but yeah, most, if not all, communities seem to have had some pigs because they can eat sort of household waste. They can just root around in woodlands. Pigs originally are woodland animals, um, and they can just root around and eat worms and roots. Um, they will eat grass and leaves and so on. So they're very easy to keep. So pigs tend to be there almost like a constant for all communities. Um, you, you'll get them on all, even lower status sites, but as a very small percentage. So, I want to move on now to the other major strand uh, in our work, which was to look at the, uh, the relationship between uh, Roman and early medieval uh, field systems. And I'm going to have to rattle through this some of this a little quickly, because I have gone a little bit um, uh, slowly. The two strands of our research was firstly to see whether we could find evidence where Roman field systems continued in use into the early medieval uh, period. So in other words, where an excavated Roman field system has an early medieval field system, if you like, on top of it. And secondly, in many cases, Roman field systems have been excavated, but there hasn't been any evidence of medieval field boundaries. Now, this is because, if you remember yesterday, I was trying to explain this concept of open fields, these vast medieval fields that didn't have any uh, banks or ditches that would survive in the archaeological record. So in those cases, what we're actually trying to identify is the relationship between the Roman field systems and uh, the later systems of fields that were created when the open fields were finally enclosed. Here we have um, an example of uh, a site where this is the, uh, the Roman evidence. This is the edge of the excavation. This was a Roman uh, ditch dated to the 2nd to 4th centuries AD. And this is uh, the same ditch that was then recut in the Anglo-Saxon period, so the early uh, medieval uh, period. It is on exactly the same alignment. And then all of these little features here, these are all uh, plough marks within a later medieval open uh, field system. So in this particular example, I think we can hypothesize that there was continuous use of this field system because we have Roman, we have early medieval and we have later medieval and they are all on this same orientation. The second form of evidence is where we can uh, take excavated uh, Roman field systems and look at their relationship to the landscape of today. And in this schematic model, the red features are uh, hypothetical Roman ditches. And what you can hopefully see up here is that these Roman ditches are exactly uh, parallel with features within the landscape of today. In other cases, excavated Roman ditches are on a very different orientation to the landscape of today. Fossata. Now, I, I could have guessed that because that's the medieval Latin word for a ditch. So there you go. Um, so just to sort of show you once again some examples of um, English uh, countryside. 
As I talked about uh, yesterday, uh, much of this English landscape is very, very ancient in terms of its origins. And here, for example, these are fields that are still in use today, yet they are directly uh, mirroring divisions within these medieval open field systems. So we know that landscapes of this character and then these much more irregular shaped fields here. These fields, although they are still in use today, these are medieval field systems in their origins. These much more regular fields here, these fields are actually really quite recent. These are only about uh, 200 years old. Of course, these are... Uh, Character, these field systems in their characters is very different to here in Italy, where you would probably see a very regular field system such as that and think that might be centuriated and so dates from the Roman period. But we don't have centuriation in Britain, so these very regularly arranged field systems, uh, these are really quite recent. That just shows uh, some of these field systems in uh, plan form. So fields of this character are uh, medieval in date. Fields of this character are medieval. These fields we wouldn't have studied in our analysis because these are not uh, medieval uh, field systems. The, um, the data that we collected was from a very wide variety of published and unpublished excavations. All of this developer-funded survey and excavation that is transforming our understanding um, of the landscape. The red dots are sites where we have evidence for the relationship between Roman and medieval field systems. And hopefully what you can see here is that they are spread across the whole of the British landscape with the exception of a few regions uh, such as this one here which is still very, very extensively uh, wooded. Uh, one uh, sort of case study of the work that we, will, we, we uh, did this is the area to the, uh, the east of London, which is over here. This is the Thames estuary. This is marshland, uh, wetland. This is high ground. The intervening area is characterised by uh, what we would call a coaxial field system. This is a landscape where there is a degree of regularity, but not the very rigid planning that you get with centuriation. So there is regularity, but probably not uh, rigid uh, planning. This is uh, just an example of an excavation within this landscape. In grey tone here, you actually have uh, an extract from the, uh, the maps, the 19th century cadastral maps that I was talking about yesterday, and you can see elements of the landscape in the 19th century with this broad north-south orientation. What is in red here are uh, field boundary ditches that were dug uh, and started to silt up in the Roman period. Uh, in blue, you have ditches that were silting up in the early medieval period, almost certainly dug in the Roman period. And then in purple at the bottom, you have uh, field systems that are medieval, later medieval in date. Hopefully what you can see is that the, uh, the Roman field systems are on the same orientation as the early medieval field systems, and they are on the same orientation as the medieval field systems. And they are all on the same orientation, 
as the historic landscape of today that is characterized by these great long coaxial uh, elements. In a landscape such as this, there has to be the potential for continuity in the use of these field systems. They are all on the same orientation. At uh, one particular uh, site, um, the excavation here had a particularly interesting uh, sequence. This is, once again, the historic landscape of today. And the earliest settlement on this site is this enclosure here that is on a different orientation to the historic landscape of today. It's sort of on that sort of orientation rather than that orientation. This uh, settlement, this enclosure was created in the first century BC, so before the Roman invasion of Britain, and it continued to be occupied into the second century AD. It was then abandoned, and these ditches shown in black were dug around the second century AD, and these ditches are all on the same orientation as this coaxial landscape that survives through to the present day. So here, on this site, we can almost certainly pin down the date when this coaxial landscape here was created, probably to the second century the middle of uh, the Roman uh, period. Oh, that's bleached out a little. I'll move on. Um, there are other examples. This is just a field system uh, from the north of uh, England where uh, the features in solid black lines is a very extensive uh, Roman field system where you can see the fields and individual little farmstead uh, enclosures. And these dashed lines are reflecting the major divisions of the medieval uh, landscape. And once again, you can see that they are on broadly the same uh, orientation. Not as clearly on the same orientation, however, as in the previous example. And I think it is important to stress that this, in, this, this evidence is subjective as to whether something is on uh, the same orientation or a slightly different orientation. It is a subjective judgment. And to say something is on the same orientation, we argued it had to be within five degrees. So that we would say that's not on the same orientation. That would be. That was the judgment uh, that we made in this analysis. There were, of course, many, many places where the Roman field systems were on a different orientation to the medieval, and this is just an example of that. Here, um, the, uh, the Roman and the early medieval is what is shown here, and it is clearly on a different orientation to the medieval, which is shown uh, here. This map just shows, in summary, where we found this greatest evidence for Roman field systems being on the same orientation as uh, the medieval uh, landscape. The darker the shading, the greater the degree of similarity in the orientation of the field systems. And what should immediately strike you is that uh, the greatest degree of potential continuity based on these field systems is in exactly the same regions as where the pollen evidence suggested the greatest continuity in land use. Now, some of you might well be thinking they've fiddled their data, but it was actually done by two separate people. One person looked at the pollen, one person looked at the archaeological evidence, and if you like, I, I pulled it all together um, at the end. But the similarity 
in the regional patterning was very, very uh, striking. So just to draw together the conclusions from a project which did have many different uh, strands um, of evidence, I would argue that there is a far greater degree of continuity in the landscape at the end of Roman Britain than was previously uh, thought. In large parts of the lowlands of Britain, for example, 60% uh, of Roman field systems are on the same orientation as medieval uh, field systems. Where I think uh, there is a much greater degree of discontinuity, where there was greater change within the landscape, is around about the 8th century. And this is a period that historians have started to focus in on. You might be familiar of, of the work of Chris Wickham, for example, who has written about what he refers to as the long 8th century, a period when we start to see the revival of market-based exchange, the revival of international trade and towns and the use of coinage. And Britain is very much part of that European phenomenon of this expanding economy. And so what I would suggest is that uh, my colleagues in Britain should indeed adopt the term the late antique period, which is so common in the study of the Mediterranean world, because so many elements of the landscape of, of Roman Britain seem to continue into the 5th and the 6th centuries, and that rather than the end of Roman Britain being the most profound change, it was this long 8th century that was a more important period in our landscape history. Thank you. Thank you very much again for this uh, excellent uh, conference lecture class. I don't know how to call it. Uh, I think for us it's very interesting and one of the ideas that we must keep from the, from the lecture is mostly also methodology. If you have to make a big project, if you want to ask uh, uh, or answer questions, in a large territorial area, you have to put simple questions, more boot, less boot, more agricultural, less agricultural. It's a simple question because the answer is going to be so complicated. But at the end, you can answer your question. If you put too many questions or if your questions are too difficult or in many projects, there are no questions let's study this, then it's very difficult to arrive to a successful uh, result. Uh, is there any question? Roberto. Thank you. Um, will there be any way of calculating the amount of pollen produced by those trees that haven't been uh, unmanaged after the Roman period to see at which extent they influenced the data? Um, uh, unfortunately not, but what pollen specialists are starting to do is to adjust the percentages in terms of the relative amounts of pollen that different species of tree produce. And there are certain types of tree that are more likely to be managed in the way that I showed you. So um, this work is literally only just being done at the moment. And that should at least enable us to translate the percentages of pollen that we have into percentages of land use. And generally what will happen is that, say, if you've got 30% tree pollen, that is going to be something like 5% of the landscape. 
And so if you've got an increase in tree pollen of, say, 5%, that's going to be a minuscule increase in the actual number of trees in the landscape. I can confidently predict that. So we're certainly going to be able to give that spatial dimension, but I don't think we're ever going to be able to sort of pin down. It might be that this increase in tree pollen was an arable field that went out of use, but it's going to be something on that sort of scale, not an entire district was abandoned and then suddenly became forested because there's just not the, the amount of tree pollen there to, to account for that. Okay. I have another question. I didn't catch very good. If your data, the data you are dealing with for uh, environmental analysis, is data that has been already published or did you do it uh, on propose for your study? So did you do new analysis in sample areas or did you just catch what it had been done? All of that analysis was on pollen analysis that has either been published or is in unpublished reports that we were able to get hold of. Although in the southwest of England, about half of those dots was from another project that I did, but it wasn't for this specific analysis. So where I think there is scope, there are some gaps in our distribution and certainly I would like to be able to raise the funding to perhaps go and target some of these regions where we don't have much evidence. Um, but it is quite expensive, so in a way the first thing to do was the synthesis of all the existing data. That's very interesting for you. You are now, and mostly in the Laurea Magistrale, going to make a thesis. Imagine how much data has been published but nobody has made a synthesis. The thing is to have a good question and to use the data that already exists. You understand what I mean? Another thing that I always, it always comes to my mind when I, when I uh, think about early medieval landscape and Roman landscape, how many things we don't know from Roman landscape. So by studying early medieval landscape, we try to go to the Roman times and the idea that we get as late antiquities or early medievalists is change completely the idea that comes from the classical archaeologists because they don't really, let's say, care so much about non-settlements but on, on landscape. Do you agree on that? A lot of the findings this, in this project are medievalists are very happy with because they have been studying the landscape in this way for decades. It's, it's archaeologists of the Roman period that have found this um, slightly disturbing that what they thought was a very uniform Romano-British landscape wasn't. So it's the Romanists that have actually, I think, found it most innovative, to be honest. Okay. Uh, about the pollen data, um, maybe the changes, about the pollen data, maybe the changes you see are within the error, or you have uh, some estimation of the error, because I see changes in two, five percent, so. Yeah, I mean, the sum of the percentages are very, very small. Yeah, tall. so, and maybe it's st stable within yeah. the error. Because I say, it does break the periods down into quite short periods. There's all the issues over the standard deviations of the radiocarbon dates. So they use other people's data, right? Yeah. So maybe they already calculated Yeah. And, and changes of a few percentage points, they're just not really significant. I would argue, and, and pollen specialists would say, even this change in, of 5 or 6% in the tree pollen it might not actually be significant at all. Um, what is, and I, it was a huge surprise to me. I thought we would find 10, 15% changes. They are just not there. So it is a remarkable degree of, 
broad uh, continuity. And we shouldn't get too het up in little changes in percentages. Yeah, probably the next step is to see, okay, arable lands continue, boot lands continue. Is there any change in the way these arable lands were managed? in the kind of cereals or not cereals that they were producing? Are they changing also by climate reasons and, and so on? Which is... Yeah, I, mean, um, I could have talked about that. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, next, we've got all of that data. And there is this change away from an emphasis on wheat. And you get a move back to uh, growing crops that are particularly suited to the soils that you have in your hinterland. So some areas reverted to growing crops like oats that were not favoured by highly Romanized communities for making bread, but they might actually be the most suitable crop to grow on quite acidic, heavy soils that you have in your area. So what we see in the early medieval period is a reversion to, if you like, going back to the crops that your soils are most suited to. C3, oh, C4? Okay. Oh, right. Something I hate. Because I never understand what C3 and C4 plants are, but I know they change in, in some way. Okay, I think we can uh, stop here. I will thank again uh, Professor Ripon.